Here are a few examples of thinking about coverage probability of confidence intervals. So the first example is definitely not something we would ever use in practice, but can be helpful, or at least for me was helpful in understanding coverage probability. So imagine our confidence interval, we don't even look at the data, we just take the entire real line, negative infinity to positive infinity. Now if we think about the coverage probability for this interval, let's say the probability that our true theta, whatever it is, and in this example it doesn't actually matter, is in our confidence interval. Now remember, usually the confidence interval is based on the data, so from the before sampling perspective, it's random. In this case, since we just ignore the data, it's not. So uh, the probability that our theta is between negative infinity and infinity is just equal to one. Oops, that's another theta. Infinity or 100%. So it may sound like this is good, right? Higher coverage probability, all else equal, is better. Uh, but here, all else is not equal. The first red flag is that we just ignored the data, so we can't possibly be learning something from the data if we just ignore the data. And also the fact that the interval is infinitely long doesn't really help us narrow down uh, the true value of theta here. So in the opposite extreme, we could imagine we again ignore the data, but we specify a very short interval. If we uh, sort of incorrectly obsessed with that, criticism of the previous interval said, okay, well, we'll just make it really short. So it's very informative, right? It gives us a very small uh, window for the true theta. Maybe this is a mean wage rate, you know, dollars per hour. The problem here is that if let me write out again. Coverage probability. So if, say, for example, the true theta is actually 15, then we're going to be wrong regardless of our data sample. So again, from the before sampling perspective, in this case, we're not using the data, we're just always wrong. Uh, so our coverage probability is 0%. Uh, that's our, yeah, there you go. So unless the true theta happens to be in this very narrow range, we'll have a 0% coverage probability, which is sort of like the opposite problem we had before when our interval was too wide. For the third example, we'll think about something you would potentially actually use in practice. So imagine uh, our parameter of interest is P, which is the population employment probability. And uh, our estimator is P hat. That's the sample uh, proportion of individuals who are employed. And based on that, we can think about the confidence interval that goes like 
this. It looks a bit complicated, but we'll highlight some of the uh, important features and just focus on those. Let's do that. Okay, so this has the form p hat minus something, p hat plus something, and uh, so the first thing we'll notice is that this one at least passes the initial sanity check that it is using the data through the sample proportion p hat. So this confidence interval will have different values in different data sets, unlike the previous two silly examples. And we can also see that its length depends on the sample size n. So in particular, if you imagine n really, really big, like a million or a trillion or something, uh, regardless of what p hat is, this entire term here is going to be very, very small and close to zero. Whereas if n is just uh, one or two, uh, then this term will be much bigger. So when n is small, we have a wider interval. When n is larger, we have tend to have a shorter interval. So that's another good sanity check that if we have more data, we are succeeding in learning more about the population parameter. Or in other words, we have less uncertainty and that's reflected accurately by this confidence interval being shorter when we have more data. Remember, the width of the confidence interval helps quantify how much uncertainty we have. So wider, more uncertainty, shorter, less uncertainty. The third, fourth, I don't know, the last thing I'm going to point out is just that even though it may be fine if we have a large sample, uh, it's not necessarily good, or the coverage probability is not necessarily close to what we want if we have a small sample. Um, so in this case, the two, you might see it with 1.96. I just didn't want to write out the decimals. But if we have a large n, we'll have a close to 95% coverage probability. We could imagine, just to uh, make the point in an extreme case, if we only have n equal to 1, then either our individual, or one individual in the data, is employed or is not employed. So our p hat has to be either 0 if they're not employed, or 1. There's no other possible p hat. Now what that implies is that p hat times 1 minus p hat equals 0 is either this part 0 or p hat is 1 and this part is 0. And what that means is that the width of the interval, which has this p hat 1 minus p hat term over here, that whole term here is going to become 0. So then our confidence interval is just p hat, p hat. So it's either 0, 0 if our individual is not employed, or 1, 1. So that would say, you know, if we took it seriously, 0, 0 would say we have no uncertainty and the population employment probability is definitely 0%, uh, which, of course, is not true. Uh, or 1, 1 would say it's definitely 100%, which, of course, is also not true. So in this case, where we have a very, very small n, we get results that just don't make any sense. And uh, correspondingly, the coverage probability will be zero, assuming 
p is not literally 0% or 100%. So even though we're trying to get something like 95% coverage probability as our nominal coverage probability or our confidence level, our actual coverage probability here is 0%. Now, if n is 10, it's not quite as dire and extreme, uh, but it still might not be as close to 95% as we want. So all that to say, often we have formulas that are based on these large sample approximations. They may not work as well if we have a small sample size.